Stan, a very wonderful virtual welcome to Perth. Thank you very much. I really wish I could be there with you. <laughs> I wish I could be there with you in person. Blame Donald Trump. I've spent the past week grappling with the US election. I've just come off air actually in the last half hour from the ABC. So unfortunately, I can't be there with you. You're having to deal with me on the big screen and I hope it's not too big because you don't need too much of me either, to be frank. Um, but it's lovely to be here with you. I'm going to pay respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. That's the land from which I'm speaking to you today and to pay respects to Indigenous peoples everywhere and the people where you're meeting there today as well. But if people are watching online or if people are going to see this in other parts of the country, my respects as well to your people and your elders. Disruptive ideas. I've been thinking about this idea, this notion of what is disruption. In one sense, I am a disruptive idea. Just this past week, I've been broadcasting the US election. I am the, was the only Indigenous person involved in the coverage. Indeed, at the ABC, I was the only non-white person involved in the coverage. That's not a criticism of the ABC. That is, in fact, just a statement of reality of journalism and the media in Australia. It is still predominantly, overwhelmingly, in fact, Anglo-Saxon. If you switch on the television, the faces that you see are white. The producers and executive producers of the programs are white. The news directors, the people who run the news networks are white as well. For most of my career, I've been an outlier. When I walked into a newsroom for the first time more than 30 years ago, there was not another Indigenous person to be seen. I was a foreign correspondent, uh, the host of major news programs on various networks. And in every case, you'd look around and I wouldn't see people like me. I wouldn't see my own people in those newsrooms. It's starting to change, but it is changing way too slowly. So I speak to you today about disruption, knowing that my, my very presence um, is a disruption in itself. It's certainly something that Australian media landscape was not used to and is still getting used to. What a world we're living in. This has been a world, and I just heard it mentioned a moment ago, a world that has gone through enormous disruption this year. And of course, coronavirus has changed so much of the way that we live. Coronavirus has not only challenged our health and the devastating impact it's had on health and loss of lives around the world, but beyond that, it has taken something that is so precious to us, something that we value, indeed something that we have been to war to protect in our world, and that is our freedom. All of us have had to surrender our freedom to defeat this virus. We've had to shut our doors. We've had to shut our borders. Our businesses have closed down. It's extraordinary to think, isn't it, that in Australia, in 2020, this past year, it was actually illegal to go to school or to go to work. It's a remarkable thing to contemplate. Coronavirus has revealed and accelerated so many of the strains that exist in our world. It has revealed the fragility of our economies. It has revealed in many cases, in many parts of the world, the fragility of our healthcare systems. It's revealed that for all of its strengths and all of the progress that it has come with it, the idea of globalization has limits. The free movement of people, open borders, plane travel to anywhere, anytime in the world has also shown that we can transmit disease anytime, anywhere in the world. For a world that has increasingly over the span of my lifetime been about opening up, our borders have been our salvation. And you know this as well as anyone in Western Australia. The strength of our borders has actually kept us alive in some cases. Now, what is that going to mean for the world, a world that in fact will have to rely on open borders and greater cooperation to defeat coronavirus? Do we get our economies back? Do we get back to traveling as frequently and as openly as we had done before? Coronavirus has challenged the idea of freedom. It has challenged the idea of openness, of, 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 of globalization and of free movement of people. And of course, it's challenged our economies. It came out of China, and it has also revealed, I think, for us, it's put front and center the challenge of living in a world where China is emerging 
as the biggest economy in the world and a superpower to rival the United States. It has, of course, decimated the United States. Coronavirus has killed more than 200,000 people. There are 9 million people affected. And right now, as we speak on this day, there have been more than 120,000 new cases in the United States alone. It has shut down the US economy and it has added, I think, to the divisions that we've seen in the United States and we've seen this in the US election. If we take a snapshot of our world over the past two decades, and what do we see? We see, if you take the 9-11 attacks on New York, we've seen wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've seen civil war in Syria, we've seen a rise of terrorism in parts of the world. Um, we have seen as a result of that the flow of refugees, particularly into places like Europe, which has led to a resistance and a blowback against that, which has led to borders going up again to stop the movement of people. And it is also seen off the back of an anti-immigration push, the rise of a far-right politics. In some cases, a return to what can be termed as fascism across Europe something that we hadn't seen since the 1930s. At the same time, as we see a rise of this populism, a rise of right-wing politics, a greater authoritarianism, we have seen that the strong man leader has made a comeback. And just think of them. Xi Jinping in China, Vladimir Putin in Russia, Viktor Orban in Hungary, who proudly boasts of a democracy that is illiberal, we see Viktor uh, uh, Erdogan in, in Turkey uh, increasingly cracking down on free speech and the media. Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, Boris Johnson, you could say, in the UK, and Donald Trump in the United States. All of them, to some degree, tap into a, a populist wave, the idea of a pent-up aggression, a rejection of the outside world in some cases. Uh, they tap into a feeling of resentment and anxiety, and they exploit that for political office. That's a reality in our world today. Democracy has been in retreat. Freedom House, which measures the health of democracy around the world, now counts 13 straight years, 13 straight years of declining freedom. That means that we are less free and less democratic than we were last year or the year before or the year before or the year before that that there are fewer democratic states in the world according to the definitions of Freedom House. At the same time, we've seen a rise of authoritarianism and China, and I'm going to come to China in a little bit more detail later. So we have disruption, we have coronavirus, we have disease, we have economic collapse, we have populism, we have erosion of democracy and a rise of authoritarianism. I think Prime Minister Scott Morrison probably summed up this period most adeptly and succinctly recently when he said, we live in a world that is poorer, more disordered and more dangerous than we have seen probably any time since the 1930s. If you take what we are seeing in our world today and you overlay that to the period between 1914 and the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, it is eerily similar. You have a rise of a power in China and a weakening power in the United States. Now, if you go back then, you have the rise of Germany in the lead up to 1914 and the weakening position of the United Kingdom, and that tips the world into war. You have the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, at the end of the First World War, which killed more people than World War I indeed itself did. And what do we have? We have coronavirus. They had the Depression of 1929. And what do we have? We have the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. Of course, there was World War I, and we have not had a world war, but we did have the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan that have never ended. And of course, we've got the ongoing conflict across the Middle East. And if you look around the world right now, from Africa to the Middle East, to Ukraine, um, to the tensions between India and Pakistan, India and China, which just this year alone stared each other down on the border and exchanged gunfire and soldiers on both sides were killed. There is conflict and there are the seeds of an even greater conflict potentially to come. Today certainly does echo the past. I think it was, I think it was uh, Mark Twain that once said that history doesn't repeat but it does rhyme and what we're seeing now I think is the rhyming of the past. So a disrupted time and we're having a conference talking about 
disrupted ideas. And I wanted to think about what are disruptive ideas. I wanted to challenge you. I want you to think. I want you to think hard and I want you to question your own values. I want you to look into yourself because I do this all the time. I spend most of my life thinking, reading, challenging what I think, questioning myself. I've traveled the world. I've reported from different parts of the world. And I know that there is not just one answer and there are no easy answers. Do we really want to be disrupted? You can come here today and I'm looking at some of you sitting on the steps and you're bathed in beautiful sunlight. You don't have to social distance. Um, <laughs> if someone's waving to me, I'll, I'll wave back. Um, you, don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to social distance and, that, and that's a blessing. You can drink your coffee and you can listen to nice ideas. You know, we can come together and we can explore ideas. But do we really want to be disrupted? Do we really? Or do we just want to push ourselves a little bit, but not too far. And I think about the lead up to this discussion here today, and I know there was a lot of debate and conversation and some commentary around the invitation of someone like Jacinta Price, who was meant to be speaking at, at, uh, at this festival. And I know that there was some pushback against the organisers for that. And I think about this and I think, isn't that what we need though? Don't we need to hear other people so that we can challenge, so that we can debate, so that we can have this discussion? We hear a lot about cancel culture in our world today, shutting people down. I lived and worked in parts of the world where people are killed for their beliefs and where people will die for their beliefs. I lived in parts of the world where I would go out and interview people who would just as easily cut my throat. I have walked through bombed out marketplaces where the blood is so thick on the ground that I could taste it in the back of my throat, where I would see mothers digging bits of burning flesh out of the shell-marked walls after explosions and putting it into plastic bags because it is all they have left to bury of their children. And I know that the idea of free discussion and debate is precious. If we don't like an idea, bring a better idea. Push back, challenge. That's what we need to do in the world. So I want to run by you today four disruptive ideas. And I want you to think about these ideas and I want you to be challenged by their, these ideas. And I've chosen them deliberately to be provocative. And here's the first one. Donald Trump was necessary. Now we all know, we all know the failings of the Trump presidency. We've seen in recent days that he has no respect for truth, that he is someone who will send dangerous messages to his own people, that he has ruled not as a unifier, but as a divider. He has come to power because of division. But was Donald Trump necessary? Think about America. Think about the drift of America. Go back to the 1960s. In the 1960s in America, you have tumult, you have the Vietnam War, you have protest. You have John F. Kennedy, the president, assassinated. In 1968, his brother, Robert Kennedy, assassinated. Martin Luther King, shot dead. Malcolm X, shot dead. The 1968 election, where we started to see the seeds of the populism and the anger that has led to the election of Donald Trump. There has been a slow unraveling of America, and there has been a solidifying of power in America. And with that solidifying of power, the monopolization of power, has come a contempt for people left behind. If you look at America today, a, a working class person, their wages today are less than they were earning 20 years ago. Try this for a statistic. Between 2014 and 2017, in America, life expectancy decreased. Think about that. The richest country in the world. Life expectancy decreased. People were dying younger year by year by year. It was happening because of an ongoing sense of hopelessness. People left behind, an opioid epidemic that had spread amongst the community, increased suicide, drug and alcohol addiction, and of course, gun violence. The United States where there are more guns than people. The political agenda, the political class had come to monopolize power. The top one, five percent, hold the majority of wealth in America. And they hand it on to their children who dominate the places at the best universities in America. Think about the presidency. Just think about this. 
if you go from Ronald Reagan, whose vice president is George H.W. Bush, who in turn becomes president, who then goes to Bill Clinton, and then goes to George W. Bush, George H.W. Bush's son, and then Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton, is Secretary of State in the Obama administration, and she runs for election in 2016. And she loses, and Barack Obama's vice president, Joe Biden, is now on track to become the president of the United States. Power has not shifted in America. They are handing it down from family to family within families like an aristocracy. That's the monopolization of power in the United States. It's been called by Michael Sandel, the Harvard University philosopher, a tyranny of merit. He calls it the meritocracy, the new aristocracy. Those people who say to those poor and left behind that they can do it if they try. Barack Obama repeated this phrase, you can do it if you try, more than 140 times in speeches during his presidency. Well, no, they cannot do it if they try because the system has been working against people, against social mobility. When power is controlled in the hands of a few, it locks other people out. And don't think for a moment that because these people are on different sides of politics, that they represent anything different in terms of points of view. They all come from the same place. They go to the same universities. They live alongside each other and they attend each other's weddings as Bill and Hillary Clinton did with Donald Trump. There they were smiling at the Trump wedding to Melania. The meritocracy that Michael Sandel talks about is entrenched in America. What have we seen over the past 20 to 30 years in America? We've seen the weakening of communities, hollowing out of communities. People whose factories have shut down, whose jobs have been sent offshore. In the 2007-2008 financial crisis, ordinary people lost their jobs and their homes while big bankers were bailed out by the Obama administration that had come to power offering them hope. So you have hopelessness, joblessness, increased suicide, higher rates of death, an opioid epidemic. And then along comes Donald Trump and he says, ah, I see you, I hear you. He puts on the NASCAR, NASCAR cap, he eats McDonald's, he, he shows them that he's listening to them. Now, Donald Trump is a solidly part of the meritocracy. He's not there to represent those people either, but he gives a voice to those people. And if there is one thing that we have seen over the past four years, is that the voice of the left behind are no longer silent. Whether it is black, whether it is white, we have brought politics back to American life. It is contested. It is contested against Donald Trump, but it's also contested by those people who vote for Donald Trump. And consider this, Donald Trump in this latest election just got the second highest vote of any presidential candidate in American history, beaten only by Joe Biden. He increased his vote from last time, and here's something else to consider. The non-white vote, black, Hispanic, Native American vote, increased for Donald Trump. He got the highest single percentage of vote of non-white voters of any Republican candidate ever, around about 25% of non-white voters. These are disruptive ideas. Donald Trump, the person who has dog whistled to racists, who has, who has flaunted uh, and, and, and flattered the, the white supremacists, the proud boys and so on is also the president who last September delivered the highest rates of employment for African-Americans ever in American history. Contradiction. This is the heart of America. America is contradictory. Now, no one is going to sit here and say that Donald Trump has been about unifying America or dragging up the poor of America, but he gives voice to something that was in the country and something that was long overdue a disruption to the country, a challenge to politics as usual, where political power is handed down from family to family and within families. Here's a second disruptive idea. China is winning. Now that's also a very dangerous concept. I lived in China for 11 years. I reported for CNN out of Hong Kong for four years. I then spent in two different stints another seven years 
in Beijing. I saw this extraordinary country up close, this juggernaut, a country that has performed an economic miracle, a country that I'm sure some of you of my age would remember this. When we were kids, a country that could not feed itself. Remember being told by your parents, eat up your food because there are people, children starving in China? China today is on track to become the biggest economy in the world, to surpass the United States. By some measurements, it already has. A country that could not feed itself has lifted 700,000 people out of poverty. 700,000 people out of poverty. A country that in 1989 turned its guns on its own people in the massacre at Tiananmen Square. Deng Xiaoping, the leader, ordering the army to fire on his own people, then awarded the Olympic Games for, 2000, uh, for, for 2008. China has confounded history and confounded the experts. For two decades now, people have been saying this can't continue. China will collapse, but China hasn't collapsed. China has watched as America has lurched from terrorism, to war, to financial collapse, to Donald Trump. And it looks at America and it looks at the world and it says, we have a better model. And the China model is this, we will make you rich, but we will never make you free. That's the bargain. That's the deal with the people. And under Xi Jinping, China has taken an even greater authoritarian turn. He is locking up dissidents. He is locking up artists and writers and lawyers. He has put a million Uyghur Muslims into detention in what human rights groups call brainwashing camps. He has cracked down on protests in Hong Kong. He is drawing red lines with Taiwan. He's talking about a rejuvenation of China that means bringing Taiwan back to mainland China. He has claimed and militarized the South China Sea despite a, war, a, a ruling from the, the maritime court in The Hague that he was not to do so. Xi Jinping looks at the West and he believes China's model is better. And right now, when you look at the state of America and when you look at China, who would blame him? COVID-19 came out of China, but China has it under control. China's economy is growing. China's economy will grow by what is projected to be around 8% over the next year. What does it mean for our world in a world where China is winning? What we see is progress. What we see is democracy. What we see is the inevitable triumph of democracy in the world that we have believed like a, a tenet of faith is being turned upside down. It was 30 years ago last year that Francis Fukuyama, the American political scientist, at the fall of the Berlin Wall and then ultimately the collapse of the Soviet Union, wrote his famous essay, The End of History. And he believed that the triumph of liberal democracy represented the end of history. Not that events don't happen, not that time doesn't change, not that people don't change, but the big ideological struggles are over. Liberal democracy, he said, had won. It was the last ideology standing. How wrong he was. History didn't end. History has returned, and history has returned with a vengeance. In the same year, 1989, when he was writing The End of History, we were celebrating the collapse of the Berlin Wall and an outpouring of freedom. China was turning its guns on its own people. Fast forward to 2020, and China is on the cusp of becoming the most powerful economic country in the world. And we're feeling this in Australia right now. Our exports are being cut back. Our government ministers cannot pick up a phone and call their counterparts in Beijing. China is winning. Here's another dangerous idea. It may sound strange coming from someone like me, but I want to explain this for you. Identity is poison. Identity is poison. All around the world where I have reported, I have seen the worst of identity. Now, I'm not talking about what you identify as. I'm not saying that we don't all have an identity. We do. I can speak my own language. I am a Wiradjuri man, a proud Wiradjuri man. That's part of who I am. My mother is a Gummeroy woman. I have a Darawal great-great-grandfather. I have Irish ancestry. I'm an Australian citizen. I'm married. I follow a football team. I'm a father. I'm a son. All of those things are part of my 
identity. They are identities, but I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about an identity that pits us against each other, an us and a them that doesn't see our common humanity. I've seen this everywhere. One of the things that Francis Fukuyama overlooked in his end of history thesis was the power of identity. Think about what happened after 1989 and then later the collapse of the Soviet Empire. What did we see? We saw the war in Rwanda, Hutu versus Tutsi, a war of identity. The collapse of Yugoslavia and the war in the Balkans, wars of identity. We've seen the rise again of, of Russia as a global power, where Vladimir Putin talks endlessly about the collapse of the Soviet empire as being the great catastrophe of the 20th century, identity. What is the rise of the far right across Europe, if not identity? What is Donald Trump, if not identity, tapping into a, an anxiety and a fear and to make America great again? Because this is what identitarians seek to do. They're not interested in the future. They're always looking at the past. It's a, a militant, toxic nostalgia. Mark Lilla, the American political scientist, calls this the shipwrecked mind. The shipwrecked mind. The shipwrecked mind doesn't see the future. The shipwrecked mind sees only the debris of the past floating by them. Identitarians, identity demagogues, constantly talk about the past. But it's not about remembering the past. It's not about acknowledging the past. It's not about telling the truth about the past. It is weaponizing the past. It is a virulent history. It is a toxic history. It is the history of what Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher once called ressentiment. Ressentiment, which is the idea that history is a wound that you return to over and over again. You do not want to move on from history, but you want to return to that wound because it is the source of identity. And in that source of identity, you pit people against each other. In China, when I was there, every single speech that would be delivered by a Chinese political leader would talk about the history of humiliation. The history of humiliation. They're still fighting the opium wars, the invasion of the British, and from there, the foreign dominance of China, the French, the Japanese, the Germans, that this occupation and domination of China is a scar on the soul of China. China, for all its greatness today, for the fact that it has triumphed over poverty, the Communist Party has lifted people out of poverty and taken China to the apex of global power, they still cling to the narrative of the past and the vengeance and the anger of the past. And I understand this. I understand this only too well. In China, they have a phrase to eat bitterness. I know the taste of bitterness in my mouth because as an indigenous person in Australia, my history is the taste of bitterness. Every Aboriginal person knows the bitter taste of history. How can we not when our lands have been invaded and our people have been massacred and we've been pushed to the margins? When I was born in 1963, I was born to a people living on the fringes of society, born into abject poverty. Not because of my parents, any failing on my parents' behalf, but because of who we were. We moved from town to town, never a permanent home. I changed schools more than a dozen times before I was even into high school. It was transient. It was a life of vulnerability. It was a life of a lack of certainty and security. And it's directly related to our history. And we look at Australia today and what do we see? First Nations people, the most impoverished and imprisoned people in the country. That's the bitter taste of history. So how do we live with that history without it also poisoning our identity and turning us, uh, turning us against each other? That is the great challenge for all of us, to reckon with truth, to reckon honestly with truth, to bring justice to history and to free ourselves from the chains of the history. As Amartya Sen, the great Indian economist and philosopher once said, solitarist identities, those identities that are solely based around one thing, that reduce us to one thing and one thing only, they kill, he says, and they kill indiscriminately. He says that solitarist identity makes our world, it makes our world flammable. 
Here's the fourth disruptive idea. We fear freedom. We are meant to, to yearn for freedom. We are meant to believe in freedom. The idea of freedom, we believe, has animated history. I'm a great student of philosophy. I've studied the philosopher Hegel a lot. He's probably the most influential figure in my own uh, intellectual life. I grapple with his ideas a lot. Incredibly opaque, convoluted, complicated ideas. But it comes down to this fundamental idea that freedom is the engine of history. He believes it is freedom that drives history forward until we reach an absolute spirit, the absolute state, the ethical state when we are released from our chains to live a life of freedom. He says it is the world where the master and slave no longer are locked in relationships of, of dependency and anger, but both are freed from their chains. The master no longer leaves, needs the slave to be the master and the slave is no longer held in bondage. The idea of freedom, he believed, animated history. It's what Francis Fukuyama looked to when he wrote The End of History. It's a Hegelian idea that we reach a moment where he says we have grasped freedom. The wall has come down. This was Hegel's idea of the end of history. But don't we also fear freedom? If I look around our world today, I know, and I've spoken to you at the start here, of how fragile freedom is. Coronavirus has reminded us of this. Those little things, the things that bind us to each other, the things that make our democracy work, going for a swim at the beach, having a coffee with friends, going for a run in the park, reading a book in the sun, the little things the little things where we brush up against each other, where the common courtesies and kindness and generosity that we extend to each other, how all of you can sit here today knowing that you are safe and whatever your differences, whatever different backgrounds you come from, you can sit with each other and say, we can share this moment together. That's the essence of our freedom and our democracy. And this year with coronavirus, we've had to surrender that. The wearing of a mask, as essential, obviously, as it has been to fight coronavirus, takes away something as well from our humanity. The fact that we can't shake hands. When coronavirus has passed, we need to recover those simple things, those simple freedoms of smiling at someone without having to wear a mask and shaking someone's hand. That When you shake someone's hand, you are saying, I'm not a threat to you. I welcome you. I am part of you. It's an extraordinary gesture. It was an extraordinary breakthrough in human, humankind when we could do that. When we could put aside our weapons and we could put our hands out. We need to hold on to that and we need to remember that. But we have seen how quickly freedom can be taken from us. I've seen around the world how people will bend to tyranny. If I look at China, obviously people are getting rich. But people are also prepared to acquiesce to power if power makes them rich. They will take, free, they will take richness over freedom. Adolf Hitler, who brought Weimar Germany to its knees, if you think about Weimar Germany, at that point, the most intellectual, the most dynamic society in the world. They gave us Wagner, they gave us Einstein. This democracy that also saw the rise of the Third Reich, and the Third Reich did not seize power, they were elected. The Nazis were elected. Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf wrote that the German people, he said, would rather bend to the strong leader than dominate the weak leader. He said they run from the promise of liberal freedom instead to the ideology without rival. They will shun liberal freedom and embrace the ideology without rival. And we saw where that led. Stalin in Russia used to talk about harvesting souls. He said that the production of human beings is more important than the production of tanks. We know where the loss of freedom leads us, it leads us to the gulag and the gas chamber. When people give up their freedom, when they bend to tyranny, we know where it leads. And yet I have seen in our world, and I continue to see in our world, 
how quickly we, ac we acquiesce to tyranny. So four disruptive ideas that I think go to the heart of what we are struggling with in our world today. How do we live free? How do we live with our history and deliver justice? How do we reach back for those people who were left behind and bring them with us rather than leaving them to be exploited by demagogues who feed them lies and tap into their anger and their anxiety? How do we find identities in common while also holding on to those identities that are absolutely important to us? How do we engage in ideas with people, even people we disagree with, rather than just shutting down the ideas? Because I know where that leads. That leads to tyranny. I wanted to talk today to finish off with the idea of a better world. What does a better world look like? A better world. In my language, Wiradjuri language, we have a philosophy. It is called Yinjamara Winangana. Yinjamara Winangana. It's something I learnt from my father and my grandparents. Yinjamara Winangana is the idea of living with respect in a world worth living in. Living with respect in a world worth living in. It is not just enough that, I res that we respect each other. It's not just enough. We need to work towards making a world worthy of that respect. Where have I seen Yinjamara Winangana at work in our world? I have seen it in the worst parts of our world. I have seen it in people who have lost everything. I remember being in Pakistan during the earthquake in 2005. We were driving back with my television crew and I saw a light on in an open field and a small tent. And I said to my, my cameraman, let's stop here and let's walk over to that tent. I want to see what's inside. And there was a mother outside and she was cooking over an open fire, cooking all that she had left in the world. Inside the tent was her husband and her two sons. One of the sons had a badly broken leg. The day before, they had lost everything. They'd lost their home in the earthquake, their eldest son was killed and buried in the rubble. The father had to carry his other son with a broken leg down a mountainside to an area where they could get relief rations. They could get food and they could get a tent. That's all they had in the world. A mother cooking on an open fire and a family that had lost everything. We spoke to them about their lives and their hopes and their dreams and what had brought them here. And the next morning, I was in the town square early. And every day, the relief agencies would come in and they would select men to go and work for the day. And here, at dusk, at dawn, on this day, was the man I met in the tent. A man who had lost his son and his home, who had carried his other son with a broken leg down a mountainside to a tent and some food rations. And he was standing there in the town square, eager and waiting for work. That's Yinjamara Wanangana. That is respect and creating a world worth living in. I saw it in a little boy in a refugee camp in Afghanistan who had known nothing but war, who had lost his parents and had half his leg blown off in an explosion. I saw him standing by the side of the road and he had a, a homemade crutch he was leaning on. In his hand was a plastic bag and in that plastic bag were a collection of other plastic bags. And I stopped and I spoke to him. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, every day I come down here and I collect plastic bags and I stand by the side of the road because someone might want to buy one. This boy could have given up. He could have stayed in his tent. He could have stayed in the refugee camp. What gets a boy up with, a bro with one leg and a homemade crutch? to sell disused plastic bags by the side of the road. That's the human spirit. That's Yinjamara Wanangana. I know in a, after an explosion in, in Afghanistan, I went to a, 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 a makeshift hospital. And I saw this young girl lying on a bed and I saw her father sitting there holding her hand. And I went and sat with them. My cameraman was filming and I was talking to the father. The young girl had internal injuries. She had broken ribs. She had a broken leg. In any other hospital in the world with the right equipment, she'd be fine. She would survive. 
that she was going to die. She was going to die because they didn't have the facilities and the resources to save her. And her father was sitting next to her and he's rubbing her hand and he's watching the light fade from his little girl's eyes. And I tell you, you know, when I was sitting there doing it and I feel emotional now even talking about it, the tears were coming out of my eyes watching this happen. And when I got up to go, this, this father, he looked at me and he saw that I was upset and he got up and gave me a hug. He let go of his daughter's hand to give me a hug. What an extraordinary display of the human spirit, Yindyamara Wanangana. This is how you make a better world. You make it by what we bring to it, by what we do, by seeing our common humanity, not difference. We have different religions. We have different races, different backgrounds. When do we see each other? The great philosopher Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher, had this idea of becoming and not being. Being, he says, freezes us in time. We are in a constant process of becoming. We are in a constant process of change. And he had this idea of the beautiful soul, the beautiful soul who sees difference, but not opposition. That's what I've seen in the worst parts of the world, but in the greatest part of the human soul. I have seen people who see difference, but not opposition the beautiful souls of our world. And I've talked to you a lot about freedom and what freedom means to me and the importance of freedom. And we have time for some questions in, in just a moment. But I wanted to finish with a story that has really shaped me and influenced me. And I carry this story with me all the time. And I, I think about it now in the state of the world that we are in, a world, world torn apart by war and conflict, and I think about the divided United States, and I think about the erosion of liberty and justice in our world. I think about my own people and how we struggle and continue to struggle in our own country. I think about Yindyamara Wanangana and the idea of, 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 of making a world worth living in. And I'm reminded of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Soviet writer, who of course was sent to the Gulag. He was one of the souls that would not be harvested. He was one of the human beings who would not allow himself to be produced by a Stalinist regime. He was sent to the Gulag and he told this story that he called first cell, first love. First cell, first love. He said, you never forget your first prison cell because there he found love. He said when he was sent to the Gulag, he was sent to solitary confinement and he'd spent so long there that he'd forgotten what it felt like to touch another human being or to look at another human being. He was eventually let out and he was taken to his first cell. He said the door opened and there were three bedraggled faces in there, long hair and matted hair and beards. He walked in and they turned and they smiled and he said, He'd forgotten how beautiful the smile was. And as they turned to him, they said, Are you from freedom? Are you from freedom? An extraordinary idea of a man who was sent to a gulag, having his freedom taken from him, who refused to allow his freedom to leave. He said in that moment, he discovered what it means to say the word we. We as a people in a cell, finding love and finding freedom. It's a remarkable question, isn't it, to ask of anyone. Are you from freedom? Thank you so much for um, allowing me to talk to you today, and I hope I've given you something to think about, and I hope there are lots of questions, because I'm really looking forward to taking some of your questions here today. In my language, mandangu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stan. Um, I'm, I'm really taken by that uh, living in a world with respect, in a world that's worth living in. And to me, I, I guess that um, that's what we're trying to explore today. What is it that would make this world a world worth living in? 
and difference but not opposition. So I'm going to just check. We've got a couple of microphones. Can I just see where they are? Okay, so do we have any questions for Stan? Okay, there's a couple up the back. Um, it'll take a little bit of time. We're split because of the sun. I'm sorry that we don't have more shade. Can you pop your hands back up, please? Yes, just... Hello, Stan. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. I'm waiting to yeah, see you. Yeah, I'm waiting to Tracy. see you. I've certainly got you. My name's Tracy. Tracy, I went how through, you going? Uh, good, good. I went through uh, COVID. Uh, going through COVID ah. as a person with a disability, um, we lost access to mm. our hospitals. I uh, heavily rely on hospitals and all of a sudden hospitals were taken away. Yeah. But in this period of time, I'd like to say I got offered um, money from uh, a person that I just only meant to pay my rent. I also got money yeah. to uh, pay my um, other bills and food if I wanted to, and then it continued on. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that COVID itself has changed our ideas in how we do mm. things as people. Before then, I don't know whether I would have got my rent. What do you think about COVID and how it's changed oh, us as a people and also how it's changed us here in Perth? That's a really beautiful question, Tracy. And, um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that you came through that. And I'm really touched to hear that story that someone was able to come to your assistance like that and offer that generosity. You know, at this time in our lives, um, when we are tested, and I've seen this in all, all around the world, we find the, be the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln would have said. And how quickly we lose that when the, when the crisis passes. We know how we come together, don't we, around bushfires and natural disasters. And we know that Australians are very giving people. I know that we give a lot to charities. And but we can so quickly lose that and, and, and lose sight of those things once the emergency has passed. Um, it has certainly changed the way that we live. There is good and bad. Um, there is no doubt that I think when we share something like this, that we all feel a little bit more vulnerable. We all realize that we are only just a breath away, literally a breath away, potentially from our own death. Um, and it should make us reflect on that. And, and I think the best of us, we see the best of us when we see that sort of kindness and generosity. It's changed the way that we do business. We all know that we're now having to work from home a lot more. Um, that's changing the way we interact with our families, with our colleagues, with our friends. It's challenged the nature of time, how we allocate time, what our priorities are. I think a lot of people have asked themselves, do they want to keep living this lives that we lived beforehand where we knew we were on this treadmill and we were ridiculously time poor and we were stressed out and we wonder what all that is for when we realize how quickly something can be taken from us and when you face a a greater threat as we all have. So I think it's changed the way that, that we work. It's changed the way that we interact. I worry that on a geopolitical global level that it's revealed um, the potential to disappear behind our own doors. I worry about borders going up again. And I worry that in the coming out of COVID as all of our economies are affected, that, um, that we turn away from each other and we look inside I worry about what they call this vaccine nationalism, um, that as a vaccine becomes available that is hoarded and used by particularly the richer nations in the world at the expense of the poorer nations in the world. So what I would hope, Tracy, just in summary, is that we can take your beautiful experience and the generosity and the kindness you, ex you, you, you experience from others and to be able to overlay that across other aspects of our lives and to make sure we don't lose sight of each other and to make sure that we understand our responsibilities to each other, regardless of where, wherever we are in the world. That'll be a good thing if this emerges from this. But there is no doubt COVID is going to change our world and has already changed our world in ways perhaps we don't even realise yet. Okay, next question. Could I perhaps get you to stand up when you ask your question? That will help Stan to see where you are as well. Uh, hey Stan, how are you going? <laughs> 
G'day, mate. How you going? Um, yeah, good. My name's Tim. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so... Tim, hi. Currently, the world is incredibly polarised, and you can kind of see that in the election in the States, <laughs> but yeah. you also see that people aren't as willing to share their ideas as anymore. So, you know, Biden was ahead by mm -hmm. 12 points in the polls, and now it's coming down to 10,000 votes or something. Um, do you think that there's a practical way that we can walk back this tribal mentality that we're sort of getting where, you know, you get labeled and anyone who's Republican is a stupid racist and anyone who's a Democrat is a libtard snowflake, yeah. whatever, BS. Do you think there's a way we can walk that back so that we can actually start properly sharing ideas and debating again without people just writing off ideas and then it ends up being a silent thing where they go into a polling booth where no one can see yeah. them? and express their ideas instead. Yeah. Can we go back to actually sharing disruptive ideas properly? Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I've got one really simple practical suggestion. Make sure that every single person on Twitter is identified. There's the first thing you do, right? I want to see your name and I want to see your face. No, ca no coward's castle, no hiding behind anonymity, no fake names, no fake accounts. If you want to say something, then you be accountable for it. You put your name and your face to it. See how brave people are then. See how insulting people are then. When they are going to actually have to own their own comments. I think it is poisonous what we have seen, particularly on social media. The way that people attack, the way that people form those tribes and go after one another. It has, it has absolutely weakened the sort of quality of our public discourse in really dangerous ways and it leads to the sort of demagoguery and political tribalism and partisanship and populism that we see in other parts of the world. And think about this, each new communications technology brings with it the threat of danger. It was the Gutenberg press that lit the fire that you could see uh, emerge in the Thirty Years' War, the religious wars of Europe, which completely changed the nature of Europe and gave us the modern state. If you look at the microphone, the microphone amplified the fascist voice of 1930s Europe. If you take away the microphone, if you take away the moving picture, Hitler is a voice in a beer barn in Munich, but he's elevated. His voice is amplified through the microphone and social media we have seen. Now, I don't want to make the mistake, and it's very easy to do this, to say Donald Trump is like Adolf Hitler. He's not, not anywhere. But he has used social media and other populists use social media in a similar way to feed into that tribalism and that anger. I think it's a really simple and very practical thing. If you go, if you want to go on there and you want to engage in debate, put your name and your face to it. See how, see how that works. And I think that's a really practical thing. We don't see it. We don't see it because there's too much invested in this vitriol, in feeding this, this beast, this anger, this tribalism. It, is, it would seem to me a very simple, practical thing to do. Why isn't it done? Why are people allowed to go onto social media, to Twitter in particular, and launch the sort of attack that we see launched on other people? The other thing is what we're doing here today, having civil conversation sharing ideas. You know, one of the things I really like to do, I love to read people I don't agree with. I like to, to listen to other ideas. If people come to you in good faith, if, if there is a good faith sharing of ideas, I've got no time for racists. I've got no time for hate speech. I've got no time for people who want to inflict violence or, 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 or to inspire violence. We need to shut that down. But if people want to come in good faith, and they want to have a conversation. I want to have those conversations because I tell you what, I've changed my mind about things. And we should change our mind about things. We should be open to that. One of the worst things I think we see in our society is when we don't allow politicians to say I was wrong or I'm sorry, I've changed my mind. If a politician does that, we say, oh, well, they're wishy-washy. You know, they're, they're a flip-flopper. Um, they don't have the courage of their convictions. What a load of nonsense. I think it might have been John Kenneth Galbraith or, 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 or you know, it may have been Keynes who said, you know, when the, um, the facts change, I, I, I change my mind. I'm open to that. I love it when, I've, when I go through a process and I read and I think and I go, you know what, 
I was wrong about that and I see this differently. Or even if I don't see it differently, I'm open to a different perspective and my own view is challenged. John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, once said, he who knows only his side of the argument knows little of that. How can you be sure of your own views if you haven't tested them? And we test them by coming together in peace and good faith and sharing our ideas in places like this today. So what you've done today and what everyone else has done here today, you know you deserve applause because you could be doing anything else and you've come to a place where you can share ideas. And that is what we need to hold on to. Okay, uh, more questions? Can you pop your hands up? There's one in the middle here. And then if we can have a hand for the next one. Okay, oh, down the bottom. We'll take the down the bottom one. And then there's a lady standing straight down from the tree. Hi, Stan. My name is Bella and I come from the Perth Hi. Hills. I was wondering what your view on is how youth without the power of the vote can change the world. Because we've seen recently the development of youth who speak up, how they're changing the world. I was wondering what your opinion is on it. Yeah. Well, you know, we've seen that um, in, in recent times, haven't we, with the, particularly the, um, the climate change action. You know, the failure of our generation, my generation, to deal with these existential crises um, is something, you know, the youth have been able to point out to us. And they're the people who are going to inherit this world. It is the youth of the world who will have to live in the world that we have left behind for them. And so I think that activism and I think that voice is really important. I, I would also caution, and I, you know, I have um, my own children who are interested in the world and they talk about the world and you know, we have great conversations and they've been brought up in different parts of the world. They're very open to things. But I'm always saying to them too, um, think. Think for yourself. You know, I know what it was like when I was 18 or 19 and you're full of the passion of, of youth and you're exploring new ideas and you're reading books and some of those ideas can be incredibly exciting and some of them can be really dangerous too. Um, and, and, and you get swept up in that and, uh, and I remember that myself and it's good to be idealistic and angry and to have that passion and spirit. That's what we need to bring to public discussion and debate. But to also be aware that you're going to change over your lifetime and to open up to listening to other people and thinking about other people. That, you know, if we're dealing with something, and let's just take climate change as an example, and that's one that springs to mind because I think obviously we've seen the youth take such an incredibly powerful position with this and Greta Thunberg and others who've led this sort of wave of youth protest around the world that has forced governments to listen. If you take something like that, one of the things that I've found in my life is that there's never just one side to an argument. And, and while we have to embrace policies to, to move to cleaner forms of energy, we know the devastating impact it's having on our planet. We only need to look at the bushfires that we had in Australia last year to be reminded of how close to home that can be. We only have to look to our election last year to realise that people who feel left out or left behind the people who are told we're going to shut down your minds or take away your jobs, how they will turn as well. And they have power at the ballot box too. And I think in any of these discussions about dealing with existential crises like climate change, dealing with questions of race, dealing with cultural issues, that we're mindful of the fact that we need to be able to open our minds and speak to other people. And when decisions are made that inevitably are going to impact communities, and sometimes negatively, that we think about those communities and we work with those communities and we find ways to, uh, to bring people through those transitions so people are not left behind. So I would say to the youth, you know, you have an incredible energy um, and an incredible passion and you're going to make the world. Not people like me, we've had our go. You're going to make the world. Think about the world you're going to be making. Think about the person on the other side of the argument, someone who disagrees with you, and think about how you can reach out to that, think about how you can open your mind to that, and think about how we need to communicate. You know, protest is full of passion, and, and, and it's full of noise, and that's great. Uh, but when the noise dies down, 
when the slogans and the banners are put away, we've got to get the work done. If we want change, protest can raise an issue, but then you've got to get the work done. You've got to get the policy in place. To do that, we need to be able to work across all sides. Um, so to youth leaders, to those who are emerging, who are going to be the voices of the future, do a better job than we have in being able to speak to the other side and bring people with you. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the lady here with the green, but is there anyone else with another question so we can get the microphone? Uh, right up the back, the gentleman in the black T-shirt. Okay. Are we here first? Yes, yep. we are. Me? Uh, yes. Oh, hi, Stan. Thank you, everybody, for doing this event. <laughs> hi. How are you doing? It's been fantastic. Um, I've been really interested to hear about how knowledge and learning and reading has been so important to you in forming your perspectives. Oh, thank you. I've heard you mention Hegel. I thank haven't you. heard that name for 30 years since my first degree. Yeah. But I'd also be interested to know which feminine discourses have had an impact on you and shaped your ideas. Which female thinkers and writers do you absorb? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you straight now, the first person who had the biggest impact on me in my life was my mother. <laughs> Um, she gave me the love of stories and she gave me the love of ideas. You know, my dad was a sawmiller. He was a tough guy. He worked in railroads and, you know, my mum knew that I had a passion for reading. I was really fascinated by reading. Um, and, 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 you know, that was, that was really integral to me. And, um, she would bring books home, you know, we were really poor family and I didn't go to school very much. Um, but I, I loved reading and she'd bring books home and I was seven or eight years old and I'm reading Hemingway or Steinbeck. I was reading Greek mythology because that, that, that's, she'd find a book and she'd bring it and I'd read it, you know. So my mother told me stories and in our culture, my grandmother, my great grandmother, they were absolutely important to us. So I, I come from that tradition. You know, I, I don't think to this day I've ever swore, sworn in front of my, my mother. Seriously, I would not dare because of the respect and the deference we have for our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers. Absolutely important. You know, I, I'm a great lover of um, about books that have influenced me. I mean, great writers like James Baldwin, of course, you know, was hugely influential for me. Um, Richard Wright, um, Ellison, you know, but then if you look across at people like James Joyce, um, uh, Yeats, I, I was really interested in, I'm really interested in philosophy, so uh, you, I mentioned Hegel, but, but Kant and Hume and, you know, th those Enlightenment philosophers who, um, who help create the modern world in the good and the bad. And I think the struggle of ideas um, and testing those ideas has been really influential and important to me. And, and and in terms of, of female, you know, writers especially, I suppose more sort of philosophers. Um, uh, Katrina Forrester is a, is a young philosopher now who I find just incredible. And she just wrote a really good book that was largely based on, on um, John Rawls and, and his philosophies, um, the political philosopher of the, of the American political philosopher of the... Um, of the 20th century who gave us the idea of the veil of ignorance. Um, she wrote a terrific book about him recently, which I really enjoyed. Martha Nussbaum um, is a really interesting philosopher who writes a lot about, about uh, healing and, and, and history uh, and, and hope. Um, Hannah Arendt, of course, because I'm, I'm a great student of sort of totalitarianism and, and, and history. And so I, I, you know, I, look, I look to her a lot. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are people like Toni Morrison as a writer and as a, as a non-white writer myself. I've really taken a lot from her work, particularly the way that she was able to centre black lives in all of their humanity. You know, so many things that she said have had such a profound impact on me, but particularly the idea that she said once that her struggle was to live free in a, in a genderized, racialized world, that she didn't want to be defined by what she called the white gaze and how she would write black characters as fully formed, not speaking back to whiteness, not dominated by whiteness, but living their own lives. You know, so I, 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 I was really sort of, you know, really influenced 
by her as a as as a writer, and I and I'm really mindful um, of sort of gaps myself in that knowledge, and and you have to be really mindful of that. That part of exploring ideas is to see what you don't know, you know. So when I read a, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not female, you know. So I don't I come to that, and I'm I know I'm looking at that through my own eyes. Um, and how do I challenge those ideas in myself? So I'm always sort of grappling with that as well. And, you know, in the 1960s, I grew up in that sort of 19, early 1970s period. I was very influenced by um, the African-American political movements at that time. And so my, some of my cousins were involved in the tent embassy in Australia. So people like Angela Davis really sort of loomed large as well for me. And I, I've seen her this week talking about the, the election in the US. And so people like that really, um, really sort of have a, have a profound impact on me as well. As much to say to me about what you don't know and challenge your own ideas. I think that's really important. Okay, I think we have time for one last question as we're heading towards the end of this session. So we'll... Hi, Stan. Um, thank you for a fantastic keynote. I've got a question about your last disrupted idea. So the idea that we fear freedom. What I understood from what you said mm. was that freedom is hard won, freedom is fragile. But could you unpack that concept of why we fear freedom a little bit more? Mm. I, I, I've, I've always, you know, one of the fundamental questions that I've really grappled with all around the world is this question. Given a choice between freedom and security, which do we choose? Um, I have seen the silence and the acquiescence of people to the most appalling crimes of humanity, you know, where people will not speak, when people will look away. Um, I, I've, I've seen that. Um, I, 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 so I really sort of wrestle, wrestle with that, that sort of fundamental idea. It goes back to what are we hardwired for? And I think it's, it's, it's the challenge of the sort of human soul in a sense. You know, if you look at humanity, it's been a struggle to survive, right? Right from the start, our survival. From the moment that, that we move from one part to another, we go over the hill, we move to the other country, we, we, we compete for resources with another people. The first thing we do is we look to conquer or to subdue. This is what we've seen throughout human history. Is our impulse to conquer and subdue and do people then acquiesce to that power just to survive, just to get along? Or do people stand against that and fight for freedom? You know, and for every Alexander Solzhenitsyn who says, you know, that question, are you from freedom? There are countless millions of others who look away, who acquiesce because power is absolute. And I, I see this, you know, from my time in China, um, the extraordinary achievements of the Communist Party, the extraordinary achievements in lifting people out of, out of poverty. Um, and yet, people will never be free. They will not be free to express ideas and have political discussions that challenge the party, for instance. But then, <laughs> just to make it even more complicated, what is freedom? What is the construct of freedom? I mean, freedom as we see it in a, in a modern world is an enlightenment idea of progress. But guess what? That came at the cost of indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, right? Who had, to, who had you know, our liberty taken from us, our freedom taken from us. So freedom is not is not a, a, a sort of simple concept in itself. It's loaded with its own history, its own baggage, its own philosophical ideas. There is no doubt that freedom in the world has often been the privilege of, of whiteness too. That has undoubtedly been the case. And in China, is freedom the right to have food and security? Uh, is that more important than a democratic freedom? where you elect a government, but the government ignores you or leaves you behind, um, where you have to subject yourself to the will of the majority. Is democracy freedom? When, when we vote, half of us do not get the government we voted for. 
But we have to accept that rule and believe that the institutions of our society are strong enough so that we don't endure the tyranny of the majority. There is always a tension in, in society between freedom and security and responsibility. And I suppose that idea that we fear freedom is something that I've really wrestled with. And I have seen far too often uh, that how, how tyranny can take hold and how people acquiesce to that. And I think it's the struggle of the human soul between the desire to be protected uh, and to be secure, but then also finding the courage to stand up uh, and fight for our freedom as well. Thank you, Stan. We're, really, we're so pleased that you could take the time to be with us today and-, and Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank thoughts. you. We're sorry we couldn't welcome you to wonderful Perth, but perhaps another time. So please uh, Donald, join with me. Donald Thank Trump you, is to blame for that. <laughs> <laughs>